One of our most popular videos is one of our earliest ones, and that was, what kind of karate is in Cobra Kai? And to this day, I still get the same answer. It's movie karate, it's not real. Well, they're not wrong. And in fact, it's probably the most honest and realistic answer that one can give. Even as much fun as we want to dive into any history and analytical and what it might represent, bottom line, yes, it's movie karate. So today we're going to talk about some simple tricks that movies use to make martial arts scenes better than they should be. So almost all movie karate is a lie. Yes, I'm sorry, I said it. Even your most favorite martial arts films, chances are they are lying to you. Only because when it comes to making a movie, realism and an actual realistic fight is pretty low on the priority list when it comes to structuring a scene. You know, there's a specific hierarchy they achieve and that they strive for. And the first thing on that list is drama. You're watching a story to get some sort of narrative across and the drama and storytelling event takes precedence. So whatever happens in that scene has to advance the movie forward. Second priority is choreography and that's how it's presented to us. That's, that's how the moves that they choose to show us because, and it's actually interesting because when you look back at previous films, you know, in the 40s and the 50s and 60s, it was all a lot of like boxing and fist fighting. Look at John Wayne. He was the on-screen tough guy and it was just pretty much all punches with him. Then, you know, around the 70s, 80s, we had people like Chuck Norris and Van Damme show up on the scene and now we're seeing these fancy kicks. Now, as an American viewing audience, that was kind of new. Kicks were fancy to us. so. Back then, movies got away with simpler choreography. It was turn, kick this guy, turn, kick that guy, turn, kick that guy. Now, you know, fast forward a couple of decades, we need something a little bit more than that, which you see them up the ante all the time. So, you know, we've got Jackie Chan films now, which are just incredible to watch. Films like John Wick, where they're getting, they're getting really fancy with the choreography. So you're gonna see an evolution over time, how films are choreographed and the moves and techniques that they choose. Third on the list is presentation. There's a narrative to the scene and there's a choreography to the scene, but there's also a way to present it, you know, in terms of tonality and stylistic choices and how they want you to feel. So it doesn't just advance the story forward, but it should invoke some sort of a, some sort of a dramatic response from you, whether it be to laugh, to cry, to get angry, be happy, you know, you know, cheer on your favorite actor. So, you know, that's all part of engaging the viewer into the film. Then after all that is taken care of, then they try to make it as real as possible once the other objectives are fulfilled. So realism, honestly, like realistic fighting, if you go watch home movies or realistic fights and you try to compare them to a movie, they usually don't look the same because movies have that drama structure built in. That's the whole point of their existence is to tell a story. So what we're gonna go over are just a couple of lies that they sell you and a couple of deceptive techniques that movies use to kind of make the action look better than what it actually is. So the first and foremost one we should probably talk about is perspective. The perspective that we are presented as an audience. Camera placement can sometimes be everything. All it takes is for the camera to be set up at just the right angle to appear as if a person is striking somebody else. Because when you talk about a 2D image on a screen, you know, all the fist has to do is kind of overlap the, uh, the image of someone's face and with the right sound effect and right reaction, that could totally sell the effect. And in fact, when that technique is used, most of the time, those actors are usually, you know, those swings are usually a foot or two away from the intended target, but you can't always tell on screen. So one example is the crane kick. And uh, this shouldn't be any surprise to anybody who knows me that I'm gonna use this example as one of the first examples. But in the first Karate Kid film, the crane kick that Daniel does at the end to Johnny, if you really watch, it looks like he's making contact. I mean, there's no space in between. I mean, it's, it's a clear cut connection unless you look very carefully and realize that, you know, there's Daniel and Johnny on the plane and they're slightly offset. And what that means is they're facing each other, but they're on a slightly different line of attack. But where the camera's positioned, you, it kind of compresses the space. You can't really tell. So in actuality, Daniel's foot is going in front of Johnny's face, but on screen with the reaction and the motion blur, it looks like Johnny is actually struck by the kick. Now playing off of the spatial compression, I want to talk about really quick the t uh, camera techniques of dollies and zooms. Both have the same kind of objective to get closer to the action, but they're done two different ways. A dolly, when you dolly a camera, you are physically taking the camera and moving it forward. 
moving it towards your subject. So if you've got a person standing in the field and you move the camera towards them, they're gonna get larger because they're getting closer to the camera. But the background stays the same because it's way in the back. So you actually retain the distance. You can kind of see the depth of the shot. When you zoom, zooming a camera the camera doesn't move, it's really just magnifying the image. And when you magnify the image, the background, the sub foreground, your character, your, your subject, they all enlarge at the same time. And when, when that happens, it actually compresses space. It looks, you lose that spatial difference and it makes the image look flatter. So knowing that, there's a very simple technique. If you're gonna do the, the technique of where you're gonna overlap and make it look like uh, an actress and another actor, you just add a little bit of that magnification, that spatial compression, and you can sell it even further. So a lot of movies such as Karate Kid 2, you know, when Miyagi's striking, you know, the bad guys, he's not really hitting them. And I, I'm willing to bet he was probably even two to three feet away from them, but the way the image is compressed looks like, or convincingly enough, that it connects. Now, a really interesting filmmaking tool is called the dolly zoom, and I love this effect. And there's two ways you can do it. You can physically move the camera forward while zooming out, or move the camera out while zooming in. And what that does is that keeps your subject, your, your person in the foreground, roughly about the same size, but that makes the background either stretch out and elongate or stretch and complex. It's a really bizarre effect. And as an example, we see it in Mortal Kombat when Johnny Cage realizes, you know, he's among a whole bunch of dead warriors. So it's usually used for more of a, a vertigo effect or a psychological enhancement. It, it, it's, it's usually a dire situation for your character. It's not your typical focus point, but it's, it, give something ethereal, give a little bit of an unsettling move, and it's used very, very effectively. Now, a lot of martial arts films have martial artists as their protagonists, and it's a lot easier to work with their choreography because they are experienced. But many times you'll have actors that either have very little martial arts experience or none at all. And when that's the case, unless you do a super serious training regimen over and over and over the course of months to get them to the point of looking convincing, there's some liberties you have to take, and there's a few camera tricks that are involved that can help fudge that a little bit. One common technique of doing this is the shaky cam. And I am personally not a fan of this, but you know, you want to see them to feel frantic a little bit more raw, and especially to cover up actors that might not have the fighting experiences, really close up shots that are really shaking, all you see are blurs back and forth and grunting and some people falling and maybe the occasional wide shot. I'm not a fan of this because that pulls me out of the action. If I'm watching the film that's got a martial arts fight scene in it, I want to see what's happening. It's okay to show a blur shot once in a while, but every now and then there's a movie which does it excessively. And the two biggest corporates I can think of off the top of my head are Lethal Weapon 1, you know, between Mel Gibson and Gary Busey that drove me nuts as a kid that I really couldn't see too much of what they were doing. And even Batman Begins, there's a lot of that. The later Batman films we saw better choreography, but that, that close up, that close up frantic raw action where it just blurs everything, to me ruins the scene. And that's my personal opinion, some of you might like it, but the shaky cam is definitely one way to add a raw franticness to the, to the battle, as well as cover up actors who might not have prime fighting experience. So those are some of your basic camera tricks. The editor, on the other hand, has a few tools in his toolbox to take things even further. So one is, um, the way he cuts, choice of cuts. You know, he can take, you know, on set, they film a whole bunch of different angles, typically of, of different fight scenes. The editor now has to assemble it. One trick is to cut angles, especially cutting on action. Sometimes when you cut on a movement, cut on the action, you can abbreviate it slightly, makes it look a little bit faster. And it actually ties in the shots, makes the edits look a little bit smoother, especially when you overlay sound, it can, be, it can feel a lot more natural and not such, such a jerky cut, angle, cut, angle, cut. So one of the tips is, cutting on the action. So when that punch is connecting, immediately cut to the next person reacting. So that helps smooth out the action sequence a little bit more. Now another subtle technique, it's called speed ramping. On the average, most films are filmed at 24 frames per second and they are played back at 24 frames per second. Every once in a while, if they want to enhance a quick effect or make a strike look more snappy or all of a sudden a little bit faster than it would have been in real life, is during editing, they could ramp up the frames for just that little tiny second to make it look like it's a faster strike. One example is in Cobra Kai in a tournament scene, ironically enough, it's when Miguel does the uh, crane kick. And you can see it's, it's a normal shot, they sit up, but that second his foot connects, there's like that quick little, almost a hyperspeed whip to it and the reaction is real quick and it goes back to normal speed. I'm pretty sure that's a speed ramp effect just to enhance the shot. And since we talked about before the alignment, if you look at the shadows on the floor, they're using the same trick they use in the Karate Kid where they're just slightly off plane from each other to give the illusion that he actually made contact. And this was also kind of related to a trick that they used to do, and they, they still use, will use once in a while. Um, like I said, 
On average, most films are filmed at 24 frames per second and play back at 24 frames per second. One older trick, and it's still used once in a while, is sometimes they would film action sequences at 22 frames per second, more or less, and then when it's played back at 24, it's sped up slightly, but not sped up so much where it looks unnatural. So that was a very common trick, especially back in the days when they didn't have digital editing systems, it was more, you know, reel to reel. That was a very simple in-camera trick that they could do, was film at a slightly slower frame rate, so it captured the action, but when it was projected back, it was sped up just a little bit enough to look a little more convincing. So frame rates are a tactic as well to make something look a little bit more impressive. Shutter speed is another interesting trick that's used in movie making and it's a very very subtle unless you know exactly what to look for. So for those who are not familiar, the camera shutter, the shutter speed refers to how long that shutter is open and closes as it's taken in the picture. So a camera shutter that's got a slow shutter speed, the image is open, the longer it's open, the more light comes in and hits the chip, the more motion it picks up. The faster it opens and closes, the less light that hits the chip. And what you get is when you have a longer exposure, when, you're, when your shutters open longer, your move, anything that's moving will trail. That's where motion blurs come from because th as long as that shutter is open and that person's moving, they're basically streaking. Versus a higher shutter speed will snap open and close real quick, it's gonna capture more of a sharper image. For example, the Kingsman had a fight scene in the church. If you look at it, you notice there's really no motion blurs. It's, it's almost choppy and jerky and almost a little bit surreal, but that matches the tone of the scene. They're also playing with the dolly and zooms a little bit, so they're giving it more of a comical, a little bit more of a fantasy feel to it, and that grittiness just makes it that much more hard hitting and you see a little bit more detail. But let's look at Lethal Weapon 4, for example. When they were filming with Jet Li, they did say that Jet Li moved really fast on set and it was almost hard to, they, sometimes they had to ask him to slow down because he was moving a little bit too fast for the camera to capture him. So in a lot of his shots, you see the motion blur, especially when he's fighting Riggs and Murtaugh, you know, he moves, you're not seeing very crisp frames, you're seeing blurs, and that sells the illusion of him moving extremely fast. Very effective, both of them are very effective filmmaking techniques. It really depends on the mood and what the intent of the scene you're trying to get across. And then of course we have stunt actors, we can't forget them. Many times you might have a high profile actor that, you know, might not be able to do some certain stunts or even fight, so they'll bring in stunt actors. One, and then this happens a lot, a lot of movies, especially with dangerous stunts. But there's certain ways to hide them in there. It kind of stands out as a stunt actor if you never see that person's face during the fight. And many times their, their body builds will be slightly different than the main actor. So what they'll typically do is they'll cut it in a way where it'll go back and forth between stunt actor shots and main actor shots. And I find that as long as you kind of constantly go back to a face or a close up of the main actor, show them as a quick glimpse, you get away with a lot more stunt actor shots, especially in the sequence of cuts. Now environments. Environments are one of my favorite ways that movies can get creative with their fight scenes because it's not just about one guy versus one guy fighting. I find it much more interesting if their environment is an obstacle Everything can be a weapon. Are there? Are they? Are they going? Is it? Is it on level ground? Are they fighting on stairs? Inside of a building? On the mountain? Are they in a restaurant? Are they grabbing tables? Are you know? Are they grabbing silverware? How creatively are they using the scene around them to add to the effect? In my personal opinion, I really enjoy seeing a character utilize their whole space because that adds a lot more value to me in the fight because I'm very big on environmental awareness when it comes to self-defense. It's, it's a big part of the discipline. So when I see movies really creatively use the set pieces in the combat, that just heightens the excitement for me. And I think, it's, that's, I think that's just great filmmaking. And then we have wire effects. Now, wire effects are very commonplace in kung fu films, but they've, you know, over the past several years, they've been working their way into more mainstream movies here in America. And I really think their usage depends on what you're trying to get across. Wire work is often very obvious, but it works very well in movies that have like a fantasy element to it or a little bit of a supernatural element to it. Superhero fighting, anything with magic. It definitely falls into place with that. If it's a more grounded story, you want to use it sparingly. For example, Jet Li had a little bit of some wire moments in Lethal Weapon 4, but it was subtle, it was quick, and it was just enough to give him a little bit more of a, a threat level increase to Riggs and Murtaugh. It showed his skill above there. So while it was a wire effect, it was subtle, and it sold the, it sold the moment of, okay, he's better than they are, and it heightens the danger and it heightens the excitement. So wire work, when used properly, can also be very effective. Okay, so when it comes to multiple attackers, the concept of multiple attackers is dancing in the line of realism just by default because it's very, very difficult to fight more than one person at a time, realistically. And in movies, you know, everyone seems to be a one-man army. And everyone at this point is, I think, pretty tired of the trope of 
you know, a group of guys surround your bat your, your main character, but they only attack one at a time and he takes them out. That's kind of the old way of doing it. So what do they do now? Like, how can you make it a little bit more convincing? Movement. Keep the scene moving. If you've got multiple attackers, don't just have them standing waiting to turn. Have them move. Maybe have one guy trying to climb and come forward. Maybe have another guy trying to get around another guy. Maybe your character hits one person, turns into another. Give this guy a second to recover, but keep movement going. Especially if it's a large scene, just keep the motion going. And when you cut with the motion, sometimes it's hard to get your bearing. And as a viewer, it's more exciting because you're wondering like, oh, okay, well, I see this bad guy, but what about the one he was just fighting? And you can play around with those camera angles, but I think it's very important to keep the motion going. But as an example of a movie that I think does it quite poorly, believe it or not, is Dark Knight Rises. I was actually really disappointed with the choreography in that film. Uh, the Batman vs. Bane shots aren't so bad. You know, they, they still follow the main rules. It's, they're well cut, the great one-on-one -on -one fighting uh, the, uh, choreography, but in the scenes they have a lot of background action, particularly when they're on the rooftop fighting and when the big, the big finale at the end. If you look at the background action, it is a borderline ridiculous. Look at this scene right here with Batman fighting Bane, and you see all the cops and the, and the criminals fighting in the background. Most of them are just hugging each other and doing little patty cake hits, and they're just kind of jumping. There's almost no fight choreography going on at all. They're just moving and jumping with some the occasional mimic of a move. So, I mean, when you really watch that background scene, you kind of go like, well, that just looks silly. And same thing again, like on the rooftop, when Catwoman and Batman are on the rooftop fighting, um, it's the same thing. There's just motion in the background. Even so far as uh, a guy who seems to be getting beaten up by nobody and getting knocked down after fighting nobody. So that's, as much as I love those films, that's just messy filmmaking. And that kind of drew me out of the scenes because that's an example of bad background motion. So you want to you want to make it convincing. You want to have motion going on. You want to have the right angles. You want to be able to cut the scene together that sells the intensity, it sells the impacts, it sells the dramatic nature. Again, it all comes to telling that story. And if there's any element in there that distracts the viewer, any mistake like that, or something that draws their mind, well, you're drawing them out of the story and you're kind of losing them. So your the primary goal is to drive that narrative forward. And when all else fails, if you find yourself needing to do a stunt that's too dangerous or are weapons at play, or for whatever reason, the logistics of the scene are just too difficult, sometimes CGI is the way to go. And you'd be surprised how many times you can watch a scene in the film where you're not even looking at real live actors, they're just animated. John Wick 3 is actually a good example of this where there's some sequences where it's just animation or animation enhanced fighting sequences that you wouldn't have picked out normally. So that was just kind of maybe a little fun way to look at martial arts films to understand that the movie camera is lying to you. You know, we, we talk, it's, we, we have fun breaking down scenes and what's realistic, what's not. But again, it's all about selling the drama and selling the moment, you know, for better or for worse, whether you feel or heard some martial arts or not. But I encourage you now to go, go watch some of your favorite martial arts scenes now and see if you can pick out any of these techniques. There might be a few things that you never noticed before, especially like watching background action and watch for cuts and continuity. There's a lot of things that you might not have picked out the first time viewing. And also as an experiment, I get a lot of messages from, from viewers who are talking about different martial arts scenes. So we have this discussion quite a bit. So I thought this would be kind of a fun look. So to kind of play off of this on Thursday, if you're watching this episode today on Tuesday on this release, on Thursday, we're gonna release another episode taking a look at one scene from the Cobra Kai season one, episode five, the lunchroom scene, the lunchroom fight scene. So we're gonna kind of take that and break that down step by second, kind of analyze what's realistic versus what's cinematic about it and how it was framed and shot a certain way to deliver that narrative across. So go ahead and set your reminder for that. You can click on the bell so that way when it drops, you'll be notified right away. So that's it for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, if you want to talk about future movie scenes, if you like the, the breakdown of talking about what's realistic versus cinematic, please leave your feedback in the comments below. I would love to hear what you guys think and maybe we can do more of these in the future. Uh, so thank you so much and we will see you next time.